Hello, everyone. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes. I know you've heard this before, but a reminder again to make sure your cell phones are off. Um, also, please don't leave your bags unattended at the festival as we're un unable to take responsibility for any loss. Um, and if you see anybody who needs a seat, I mean, obviously, there's lots of open seats right now, but if it fills up, uh, if you see anybody who's unable to stand, please do give up your seats. Um, and please, hash, uh, please uh, 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 tweet um, with uh, hashtag ZJLF as often as you like. Um, uh, we'll be starting the next session in just about four minutes. Everyone, welcome to our next session, um, Cultural Encounter Sanskrit at the Mughal Court. Um, I'd like to welcome to the stage Audrey Trishki, uh, introduced by Kavita Singh. It's my very, very great pleasure 
to be introducing this audience to the remarkable young assistant professor of South Asian history at Rutgers University in Newark, Audrey Trushke. Her first book, Culture of Encounters, Sanskrit at the Mughal Court, was published very recently and is going to be the subject of the discussion today. But Audrey comes to Rutgers after two prestigious postdoctoral fellowships at the universities of Cambridge and Stanford, before which she did her PhD at Columbia University in New York. Now, Audrey Trushke, in the book that she has produced, has given us one of the most remarkable and revisionist books to be written on the Mughals in recent years. And I should let you know that the recent years have been actually very good ones for Mughal studies, where there have been a number of really, really remarkable and path-breaking books being published. But even among the cohort of very good books that have come out recently, her book, Cultures of Encounters, can rightly be called a game changer. As she points out very early in her book, if you wanted to do any studies to do with the Mughals, it was assumed that you really should learn Persian. Once you had learned Persian, then you would use Persian sources in order to write your history of the Mughals. And then the history that you wrote would be full of footnotes to Persian sources, confirming for the next generation of scholars that Persian was very important in order to learn about the Mughals. It's a circle that is designed to keep rolling on without interruption. Enter Audrey Trushke, a Sanskritist who decides to study Sanskrit at the Mughal court. What she paints for us is a fascinating picture that hasn't been painted before in the same range and depth and with as much texture of the way in which Sanskrit was invited and flourished at the Mughal court. And she gives us a picture of Jain monks turning up at the Mughal court and persuading Akbar not to fish in the lakes, not to hunt in the uh, forests, but telling him about the virtues of vegetarianism. You see images of Brahmins reciting the Athar Ved while Persian scholars frantically try to keep up in order to translate it into Persian. You hear about the way in which Kauravs and Pandavs start entering history books being written in Persian, books of world history being written, because the Mahabharat by now has been translated at the Mughal court and has entered the range of historical sources that the scholars are uh, consulting. And you hear of Sanskrit poems like the Jahangir Charita being written, Sanskrit praise poems being written for Mughal emperors. Her book is an extraordinary study, and it is a book that should make many of us reorient our image of the Mughals. But I would say that even more, it should reorient our sense of Sanskrit, what Sanskrit did, and where Sanskrit flourished in the 16th and 17th centuries in North India. And so it's my very great pleasure to ask Audrey Trushke to come to the podium and give us a presentation based on her book. Thank you, Kavita, for that kind introduction. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to be here today with all of you in the Mughal tent to talk about the Mughals. The story that I have to tell about the Mughal Empire is one that few have heard. This is a story about how, sorry. This is the story, down. Oh, hi, Philip. This is the story, Can, is this good? Oh yeah, all right. This is a story, uh, th so I'm telling a story about the Mughals that few have heard. A story about how a Muslim dynasty from Central Asia strove to become Indian, in part through accessing Sanskrit knowledge systems. I'll put it to you bluntly. The Mughals were seriously interested in Sanskrit. Over the course of 100 years, from 1560 until 1660, the Mughal kings sponsored Jain and Brahmin Sanskrit intellectuals at court, they patronized the production of Sanskrit text, and they translated dozens of Sanskrit works into Persian. We know about this history of cross-cultural interactions from a plethora of material and textual evidence. The archives here are very deep and I have traveled across India, Pakistan, Europe, and even parts of the United States and the Middle East in search of images, objects, and texts that allow me to piece together this rich part of Mughal history. 
My book's cover, for example, features an image of Brahmins and Mughals collaborating to produce the Persian Mahabharata. This image is today held in Philadelphia. Here, whoa. Uh -oh. Slide, people. Slide. There we go. All right, go one more. When we get it up, you will be able to see some of the manuscripts that I've worked on that are connected with the Mughal court. These include one of the earliest grammars of Persian, happens to have been written in Sanskrit. A manuscript of the Persian Mahabharata held today in Srinagar with corresponding Sanskrit verses in the margins. And a Sanskrit praise poem written for Jahangir. This one survives in a single incomplete copy held today in Baroda in Gujarat. Now you might ask, if there is such an abundance of evidence for the Mughals' near obsession with Sanskrit, then why has nobody else told the story before? Many of you have probably heard about the eclectic interest of Dara Shikoh, a Mughal prince who lost his bid for the throne to his younger brother, Aurangzeb Alamgir. But my story is not about Dara. It's not about princes. It's about kings, three kings specifically, Akbar, Jahangir, and Shah Jahan. Generations of Mughal historians have missed the importance of Sanskrit in Mughal courtly and political life for a rather simple reason. They weren't looking for it. In modern times, we usually identify the Mughals in two ways, as Islamic or Islamic kit in religious terms and as Persianate in cultural terms. Both characterizations are true, the Mughals were Muslims, and they grounded their court culture in Islamic political norms. The Mughals spoke Persian as their language of administration, and they gave lavish patronage to Persian medium poets and intellectuals. But these two categories do not capture all of Mughal culture. It is when we bring Sanskrit and Persian archives together that we see how the Mughals repeatedly engaged with Sanskrit and the upholders of that tradition, namely Jain monks and Brahmin pundits. Here you can see representatives, eventually, of both, of both groups in images produced by the Mughal atelier. Now, I hardly need to introduce Jains and Brahmins to this audience, so I will spare you the one-sentence overview I always give American audiences, uh, but let me just make a couple of notes. I speak fairly consistently about Brahmins rather than Hindus throughout culture of encounters. That is because Hindu, a Persian term, not a Sanskrit word, was not yet in common usage in the 16th and 17th centuries. Jains, we all know, are a re religious minority, uh, but they're less well known in terms of their contributions to Sanskrit literary culture. In fact, too often we think of pre-modern Sanskrit as a uniform tradition defined by Brahmanical orthodoxy. That is a mistake, I think. The reality is that the pre-modern Sanskrit tradition was diffuse and it was diverse. For the Mughals, the multiplicity of Sanskrit was a pretty big selling point. And so the Mughals turned to Sanskrit intellectuals, both Jains and Brahmins, as had so many Hindu kings before them, in order to access the unparalleled political resources of the Sanskrit tradition. For the Mughals, this turn to Sanskrit was also a process of self-discovery. The Sanskrit tradition was inextricably linked with rulership in pre-colonial India, and so the Mughals turned to Sanskrit in order to find out what it meant to be sovereigns over the subcontinent. So what did that process look like? How did Sanskrit play into and change Mughal political culture? What are some of the texts that came out of these interactions? These are some of the questions that I answer in Culture of Encounters, and what I want to do today is give you just a taste of what this story looks like. Let me start with the history of social relations. Our Brahmin and Jain Sanskrit intellectuals first formed ties with the Mughals in the same decade, the 1560s. The two groups tracked each other for 50 years. They were both at court until the 1610s, and then things diverge. Jains get themselves kicked out of the Mughal court by 1620, whereas Brahmins maintained an imperial presence into the 1650s. Now, several features remained notably consistent over this 100-year period of cross-cultural connections. For example, the first Brahmin Sanskrit intellectual to enter Akbar's court, Mahapatra Krishnadasa of Orissa, was both a musician and a poet. So music and literature. 
The last Brahmin Sanskrit thinker known to have ties with the Mughals was Kavindra Acharya Sarasvati. Kavindra was still at Shah Jahan's court when the king was dethroned in 1657. Kavindra was likewise a poet and a singer. Another constant was the appearance of Sanskrit poetry about and for the Mughals. The first Jain thinker to form imperial ties, for instance, Padmasundra, died at Akbar's court in 1569. But before he died, he wrote the Akbara Sahi Sringara Darpana, Mirror of Erotic Passion for Shah Akbar. This text exemplifies the nine standard Sanskrit rasas using Sanskrit verses, some of which invoke Akbar's name. Akbar is sort of the ultimate rasika in the text. While most of the work is Pakka Sanskrit aesthetic theory, there are small knots to its Mughal patron. For instance, in the opening verse, the Ishta Devata, the deity selected for, trans for praise, is not Vishnu, not Shiva, not Ganesha, but Rahman, the Sanskrit version of Rahman, a Quranic name for Allah. Later authors would pen many Sanskrit texts for the Mughals. One more prominent example is a praise poem for Asaf Khan, Shah Jahan's vizier, written in the 1630s. This was written by probably the most famous Sanskrit thinker of the 17th century, Jagannatha Panditaraja. Beyond writing text, Sanskrit intellectuals performed numerous jobs at the Mughal court. They served as translators, as we'll discuss in a minute. Especially Jains petitioned the crown for political concessions. Uh, including bans on animal slaughter and assurances of religious freedom. Their efforts resulted in numerous edicts known as farmans. You can see two examples here. The Jain community celebrated monks who received these farmans. A 1610 letter to one such monk contains depictions of these Jain figures at the Mughal court. Now, these illust this illustration was done by a Mughal court artist for a local Jain community, and the illustration is remarkably accurate. Down to the detail, if I can get one more slide, we'll see it circled of our black-clad Jesuit friends who were at the Mughal court. Sanskrit thinkers were also resident scholars, and some Brahmins were astrologers. They went by the title of Jyotisharaja or Jyotik Rai. A bilingual Sanskrit-Arabic astrolabe is extant. This was crafted by a Brahmin pupil of an Islamic astrologer at Jahangir's court. There's bilingual writing all over the astrolabe. I've zoomed in for you just on the top part. Perhaps you can make out Shri, written in Devanagari, and below that, Allahu Akbar, in Perso-Arabic script. In addition to material evidence, Sanskrit texts are what tell us about what Brahmins and Jains actually did in Mughal environs. Let me share, share here one such story of cross-cultural interaction that I discuss in the book. This is the saga as reprised in a Sanskrit text. It was penned in 1594. One time, a daughter bound by the curse of the Mula constellation was born in the house of Gloria Sultan Salim, who, that was already blessed with a son. Gloria Shah Akbar called upon wise men, such as Sheikh Abu Fazl, to counteract the curse. Then the king summoned minister Karma Chandra, a Jain, and said to him, perform whatever is the purifying rite in the Jain philosophy. Jaina Darshana is the Sanskrit there. Honoring the Shah's request, Karma Chandra directed the purifying bathing with pots of gold and silver with perfect injunctions. At the time of lighting the auspicious lamp, Jahangir, son of the Shah, came and was well received after giving 10,000 silver gifts. The minister placed water from the bathing on the eyes of the glorious king, surrounded by his harem, to alleviate the curse. What we have here, my friends, is a startling case of Mughal participation in a Jain religious ceremony. Now, in making sense of such events, it bears reminding that astrology was not a game for the Mughals. Rather, astrology was a serious Islamic science. It had cosmological and political implications. It had long absorbed the Mughals and their ancestors, going all the way back to the likes of Timur. In this instance, however, Akbar felt that Sanskrit, rather than Islamic traditions, possessed the best resources for addressing a curse on his granddaughter. Now, what I just shared involved Jain traditions, of course, but the Mughals also adopted Hindu ideas. And let me give you just one example. In the late 16th century, Krishna Dasa composed the Parasi Prakasha. This is a grammar of Persian that was written in Sanskrit at Akbar's direct request. 
As per convention, Krishnadasa praised his patron in the text opening lines. Now, there's nothing exceptional about the fact of the praise. This was totally normal and standard for a Sanskrit poem. But look at what he says. Since Brahma is described by the Vedas as changeless and beyond this world, therefore Akbar, great ruler of the earth, was born to protect cows and Brahmins. His virtuous name is celebrated across the ocean of Shastras and scriptures, histories, and the like. It's established forever in the three worlds, and thus with his name, this work is composed. It's no surprise that cows were protected by Lord Krishna, son of Gopala, and the best of the twice born guarded by the Ramas, gods of the Brahmins. But it is truly amazing that the Lord Vishnu descended in a family of foreigners that loves to harm cows and Brahmins. Akbar protects cows and Brahmins. In brief, Akbar was an incarnation of Vishnu. Now, we might look at something like this and think, well, maybe this wasn't actually meant to be heard by Akbar himself. After all, the Mughal kings did not know Sanskrit. But in this particular instance, an offhand rant by Badawni tells us otherwise. Now, Badawni is what we call a character. Badawni worked at Akbar's court for decades, and he really hated it. He, he hated everything about it. He authored an unofficial and often highly critical history of Akbar's reign. In that history, he tells us this. Cheating imposter Brahmins, all right, this is Badawni, folks, not me. Cheating imposter Brahmins told the king repeatedly he descended to earth like Ram, Christian, and other infidel rulers who, although lords of the world, had, alleged, had taken on human form to act on earth. As flattery, they presented Sanskrit poetry, allegedly uttered by the tongues of sages that predicted a world-conquering Padshah would arise in India. He would honor Brahmins, protect cows, and justly rule the earth. They wrote such nonsense on old papers, presented it to the emperor, he believed every word. So in brief, according to Badawni, Brahmins told Akbar that he was an incarnation of Vishnu. The king ate it right up, and they also gave him Sanskrit poetry to this effect. Krishna Dasa's Parasi Prakasha embodies these claims rather precisely, thus providing us insight into how Akbar's court expressed and projected Mughal power in Brahmanical cultural terms. So that gives you a bit on some of the multicultural activities going on at court. Let me turn now more specifically to translations. Emperor Akbar patronized the translation of roughly one dozen Sanskrit texts into Persian. Jahangir and Shah Jahan each sponsored several additional works. The texts selected for translation were sort of all over the map. These include both Hindu epics, Kashmiri histories, storybooks such as the Panchatantra, mathematical treatises, and so forth. Of all the Mughal translations, the Mahabharata epic, translated in the 1580s, was truly the crown jewel. As some of you might know, in Sanskrit, the Mahabharata is a notably long work. It is roughly seven times the length of the Iliad and the Odyssey combined. Another way to put that, it's roughly 15 times the length of the Christian Bible. The Mughals translated this epic in full. They also translated its appendix, the Harivamsha. Now, the Mughals translated the Mahabharata in two respects, visually and textually. Let me say something about both aspects. Visually, Persian manuscripts of the Mahabharata were often lavishly illustrated. And sometimes those illustrations add value above the text they accompany. So take, for example, one more slide. Images of the courts of epic kings often bore a very striking similarity to the Mughal court. Here you can see Yudhishthira. He basically looks like he's in Fatapur Sikri. Such images proclaimed quite powerfully a parallel between India's ancient rulers and India's current ruler, Akbar. We can get even more out of this 1598 illustration to part of the preface to the translation. Right, a zoomed in part of this is what's on the cover of the book. Now the preface at this point is discussing why Akbar ordered the translation. But the illustration actually tells us about the mechanics of translation. You see a group of Brahmins on the bottom, a group of Mughals on the top. Both groups are consulting their own books. You can see Brahmins using unbound horizontal Sanskrit manuscripts, whereas the Mughal group has opened in front of them a single bound Persian book. The two groups are communicating orally, and that is accurate. No one involved in the translation process knew both Sanskrit and Persian. 
So the way that this worked is the Brahmins sat there, they read the Sanskrit text, they translated it verbally into Hindi, that was the shared language. The Mughals heard it in Hindi and wrote it down in Persian. Uh, we know this from a colophon to the translation, linguistic evidence in the work also confirms it. The painting adds two, oh sorry, go back. The painting adds two additional elements, however. First, numerous Indian manuscripts are being collated into a single Persian book. This represents the distillation of various Sanskrit sources, and in fact, the Mughals consulted various Sanskrit versions of the Mahabharata, although they never wrote about that practice. I can reconstruct that from textual work. Additionally, note the open box of manuscripts towards the top, sort of between the heads of the two central Mughal guys. There was a very old Islamic trope that Brahmins kept their Sanskrit books hidden from Muslims. This idea dates back to at least the 11th century with al-Biruni. So this open box of manuscripts proclaims the politics of translation by framing Akbar as such a powerful king that he can bring previously hidden Hindu works into the open. Now in terms of textual translation, the Persian Mahabharata is surprisingly close to its original Sanskrit sources. I often read the Sanskrit and the Persian side by side and I rarely lose my place. Moreover, I am not the first person to have done this. We have a copy of the translation held today in Srinagar that contains Sanskrit verses written around the margins for the first part of book one. These verses are from the Sanskrit epic. They correspond to where we are in the Persian translation. They were probably written by a Hindu reader in the 18th or 19th century who, like me, had access to both traditions. Incidentally, this manuscript brings out a crucial feature of the afterlife of Mughal translations of Sanskrit text, namely that they came to be read voraciously by Hindus. Honestly, by the 18th and 19th centuries, more Hindus probably knew Persian than knew Sanskrit. And so some of them accessed their own religious works through Mughal-sponsored translations. Going back to the Mughal context, manuscripts of the Persian Mahabharata constitute some of the most time-consuming and expensive projects that the Mughals ever undertook. I've already said something about the illustrations to the translations. These are fairly well known. They're frequently reproduced but also consider the sheer lavishness of some manuscripts. For example, we have an imperial copy of the Harivamsha, the epic's appendix that's held today in the State Museum in Lucknow. Now, these are my images. I took, I took these with the permission of the State Museum. You can see that my photographs, however, are not very good. They're fuzzy around the edges, and that's because the burnished gold between every single line of text confused my camera. This manuscript is several hundred folios long, and that burnished gold, that never lets up. Now, speaking of imperial copies, we're lucky, we're very lucky. The original imperial copy of the Persian Mahabharata and the Persian Ramayana both survive today, the original versions done for Akbar himself. They're held here in Jaipur, as a matter of fact, in the royal collection. Royal seals on, and notes on both manuscripts attest that they were frequently viewed by the Mughal kings. For example, here, in addition to various small seals and notes, you can see a sort of longish note towards the top. That's a handwritten note by Jahangir himself. He wrote it in 1605 upon viewing the manuscript. Now, while we're very lucky to have these works, uh, we are unlucky in that scholars have not had access to either manuscript for decades, so I really can't say much more about them. All we really have are published folios of some of the illustrations. That said, the content of the Persian Mahabharata is available in the hundreds of later manuscripts that survive. Most of those are in India. Now, the number of manuscripts of the Persian Mahabharata says tell us something about its popularity. But I must say, the Mahabharata was not the most popular Sanskrit epic among Persian medium readers. That honor goes to the Ramayana. The Mughals initially translated the Persian Ramayana, or sorry, the Sanskrit Ramayana into Persian prose in the 1580s. That's the copy held in Jaipur today. But after its initial translation, the story went viral. We have around two dozen distinct tellings of the Ramayan story in Persian, most of them in verse. Some of these tell Ram's tale as a real, as a real martial narrative focused on the war with Lanka. For others writing in Persian, the Ramayana was a love story about the saga of Rama and Sita, union, separation, reunion. 
together, the many Persian Ramayanas attest to the vivacity of Sanskrit stories in Indo-Persian literature. Now, in addition to direct translations, the Mughals were also recipients of an astonishing range of works actually written in Sanskrit, as I have mentioned. Now, these works generally do not come with illustrations, okay, so they're a little bit less flashy, but they are crucial to understanding the depth of Sanskrit culture at the Mughal court. Now, I must clarify, I said it before, but I want to say it again. The Mughals did not know Sanskrit. My research does not suggest otherwise. So we're really not sure how they would have received these works. I can postulate that somebody at court verbally translated them or parts of them into Persian or Hindi for the enjoyment of Mughal ears, but I do not have direct evidence of that. So that's just sort of a theory without concrete backing. Moreover, the language barrier is just the beginning of our problems. Not only are these works written in Sanskrit, but they are written in high, poetic, florid Sanskrit. You not only need to know Sanskrit grammar, you need to be well-versed in Sanskrit literary conventions to get them. Let me give you my best example, which is Rudra Kavi's Kanakana Charita. Now, Rudra Kavi was a poet at the court of Pratap Shah, who headed the small kingdom of Baglan. Okay, this is in central India, right around modern day Nashik. In the early 17th century, Jahangir moved the imperial army against Baglan, seeking to incorporate it into the empire. Uh, Pratap Shah did not want to be incorporated, and so he held off the Mughal army militarily. At the same time, he asked Rudra Kavi, a court poet, to write to Abdul Rahim Khan Khanan, an important general in the Mughal army, requesting him to intercede. In the four chapter Kanakana Charita, Rudra Kavi flatters Abdul Rahim. He often uses complicated Sanskrit wordplay to do so, including shlesha, double entendre, and literary tropes such as Vyaja Stuti, praise by blame but he saves the best for last. What I want to do is give you the final two verses of the work. As I read them out, see what you get out of them, and then I'll tell you what I get out of them. Like Vishnu with Bali, victorious Khane Khanan checks powerful kings. His two sons, Mirza Iraj and Darab, are two Kamadevas fighting the Shambara-like demon, Malik Ambar. Ambara, Shambara, Madanao. Heroic Shah Jahangir has become attached to union with the dear-eyed lady of the south, who is agitated by the fierce glory of his rising passion. If Khane Khanan, ruler of the whole earth, extends his hand to touch her garment, she will be pleased. I think that Rudra Kavi is making a series of political plays through the idiom of Sanskrit poetics. In the initial verse, he invokes both classical and contemporary references to extol Rahim's military resources. First, he exalts Rahim's ability to control the maniacal tendencies of rulers, just like Vishnu in his dwarf incarnation rescued the heavens and the earth from the grip of the demon Bali. Next, Rudra Kavi mentions Rahim's sons, Mirza Iraj, better known in, in Mughal history as Shah Nawaz Khan, and Darab. Both sons performed well on military campaigns, particularly in the Deccan. Mirza Iraj was especially renowned for his success in a battle at Telangana in 1602, where he repelled Malik Umbar, a powerful minister in Ahmednagar. Rudra Kavi also compares this feat to a legendary battle between Kamadeva and the demon Shambhara. In the final verse, we finally get what he wants. Rudra Kavi suggests that Rahim, perhaps with his sons, ought to intervene on behalf of the Bhagwan ruler. Poetically put, Rahim should touch the garment of Pratap's kingdom that is being threatened by Jahangir's looming army. We have only sketchy knowledge about how this conflict progressed historically. But I can tell you that for whatever reason, Jahangir soon halted his invasion of the Bhagwan kingdom. He later received Pratap Shah quite amicably at court. Even aside from any potential impact on political events, however, Rudra Kavi's fusion of poetry and politics advances a potent agenda concerning the role of Sanskrit aesthetics in Mughal India. Here, Rudra Kavi tells us unambivalently that the classical tongue of India, the so-called language of the gods, could be repurposed as an idiom for expressing and countering Mughal expansionism. His high rhetoric further suggests that Sanskrit's strength vis-a-vis -vis the Mughal Empire lay in its depth of poetic expressions. Now, the social and literary history that I have sketched out here has many broader implications for how we think about early modern India and the Mughal Empire. 
I argue that we need to reevaluate Mughal identity and account for their use of Sanskrit ideas and texts. I also introduce a largely untouched archive of materials written in Sanskrit that are relevant to studying the Mughals. No longer, I hope, can Mughal historians restrict themselves to Persian medium sources and then go on to make grandiose claims about what was truly a multilingual imperial power. For those of you who are interested in learning more about how my work radically changes our understanding of the Mughals and their role in Indian history, I of course invite you to read Culture of Encounters. Here, what I want to do is close uh, my, my remarks today with two endings, one set in the mid 17th century and the other one set in 2017. Let me start with the historical ending. Mughal Sanskrit connections largely came to a close with the ascension of Aurangzeb Alamgir in 1658. Now, this ending can quite easily be slotted into the popular and really misguided image of Aurangzeb as a tyrannical Orthodox Muslim ruler who despised Hindus. I think that it would be an error. Rather, I argue that two things ultimately led to the breakup of Mughal engagements with Sanskrit traditions. First, by the time Aurangzeb took power in the late 50, 1650s, Sanskrit had already been largely supplanted by Hindi in Mughal imperial circles. This change was part of a larger shift on the subcontinent where cosmopolitan languages like Sanskrit were sort of on the way out and vernacular languages such as Hindi were on the rise. Uh, scholars are, were still pretty unclear what actually caused that whole sort of uh, set of events, but in any case, what was happening at the Mughal court was just one symptom of a larger cultural process. Additionally, when Aurangzeb Alamgir ascended the throne, he cut off all remaining links between the imperial court and the Sanskrit cultural world. And there was really only one link left to cut. That was the stipend that was still being paid to Kavindracharya Sarasvati. Now this decision to halt Kavindra's stipend, this was not about Aurangzeb's alleged Islamic orthodoxy. Rather, I think that Aurangzeb made a calculated political decision. He wanted to distinguish the language of his authority claims from those of the previous heir apparent, his elder brother, Dara Shikoh. Dara had been engaged for a few decades with Sanskrit ideas, text, and translations, following what was by then a grand Mughal tradition. Aurangzeb wanted no part in that. Nonetheless, I think it's worth noting that in cutting off Kavindra's stipend quite deliberately, Aurangzeb actually signaled his agreement with earlier Mughal kings that Sanskrit indeed was a tradition with deep political consequences for the Mughal Empire. My second and final ending is set today in 2017. The Mughals are not only of historical importance, but they live on in modern Indian culture and politics. Some in India today, including some in positions of political power, are no friends to Mughal history. There are people, can I get the next slide, people? There are people who want to rewrite the Mughal past as a narrative of unmitigated Muslim oppression. This is a storyline that is false. Incidentally, it is also borrowed quite wholesale from British colonial era thinkers. Books such as Culture of Encounters and my forthcoming biography of Aurangzeb out next month from Penguin India threaten political attempts to rewrite the past. Politics, no matter how loud and nasty, cannot stand up to solid historical research. Perhaps that's why I have found myself in the growing camp of scholars, both in India and abroad, who are targeted on social media for actually reading pre-modern text and seeking to make honest sense of India's complicated past. Indian history, especially Indo-Muslim history, is contested ground. Now the point here, of course, is not to be naive and to imagine that pre-modern India was some magical place where everybody got along. I would never claim that. My biography of Aurangzeb Alamgir, for example, discusses his brutal military tactics, his thirst for power, and his harsh punishments for state enemies. But alongside the bloodshed and the conflict in pre-modern India, there was this sort of openness that featured intense, diverse interactions with the Sanskrit cultural sphere. The challenge for historians is to recover that world and to explain what made it possible. That's what I try to do in Culture of Encounters. Thank you.
sure you all uh, agree with yes. me that what Audrey has just given us is a marvelous and um, quite splendid uh, glimpse into this world that I don't think many of us suspected even existed. And we're really grateful to you and your multilingual scholarship, starting out as a Sanskritist, <laughs> teaching yourself then Persian as well as early Hindi, and delving into the inter, uh, you know, the interstices within which these texts that you've been looking at uh, exist. Hey. You work on Mughal India. And you show us a picture which, uh, to a great extent, even though it covers a lot of characters and a lot of phases, uh, to a great extent concentrates on the extraordinary court of Akbar. But I wanted to know whether, when you make the suggestion that the Mughals were investing in Sanskrit, not just out of intellectual curiosity, but also for purely pragmatic reasons of statecraft, that here we are ruling mm -hmm. this country, where there is a very large population that we don't understand, how do we come to grips with them? How do we build bridges with them for good political reasons? Mm. And how do we shape ourselves as kings in a mold of kingship that is acceptable to them? So you mm. show us that there were very good pragmatic political reasons for um, fostering Sanskrit at the Mughal court, but the same political imperatives would also have applied to prior dynasties of the Sultanates, mm -hmm. let's say. Mm -hmm. So is there no precedent mm -hmm. in Indian history of other Islamic um, kingships also trying to harness the power of Sanskrit and Indic thought? Mm -hmm. Excellent question. So no historian is ever going to claim that there's no precedent for something, right? Um, so maybe one thing it hel that helps us to, to clarify that, um, you know, the, I argue that for the Mughals, the, this was about power, it was about statecraft, but it was not about broad legitimation. Right, so this was not done so that the Rajputs would feel comfortable in the Mughal state, or so that the majority Hindu population over which the Mughals ruled would accept their sovereignty, right? The Mughals went about that sort of broad legitimation in other ways. Um, this was a sort of set of, of encounters that the Mughals did for themselves. They needed a story about how they became kings of India and what it meant. Um, so in that sense, I'm, I'm not sure that all, all sort of pre-modern Indo-Islamic kings would have felt similarly, right? It, it kind of depends on what king, what sort of king you wanted to be. That said, of course, there were precedents, right? Uh, numerous Delhi Sultanate rulers sponsored translations, for example, of Sanskrit text into Persian. Um, the Tughluqs, for instance, tra did a translation of the Brihat Samhita, right? We, and, uh, at least parts Tughluqs? of that. The Tughluqs, right? In the 14th uh, century. They, they sponsored a translation of the Brihad Samhita. Correct. Is, um, and wow. and that, that, is, that is extant today. Um, we have that text. Um, they allegedly did a number of other translations as well, but not all of them survived. So you always run into the question of did they actually do them or did mm, they just claim just to do them? Um, the most important precedent for the Mughals uh, that they sort of talk about in, in their uh, Persian history is coming out of the court was Zainal Abidin in Kashmir, mm -hmm. right? So th this was um, a Muslim ruler over Kashmir from 1420 to 1470. Um, and Zainal Abidin did all sorts of interesting Sanskrit Persian stuff. Um, he sponsored some of the later Raja Taranganis, these his sort of very historical looking works that are written in Sanskrit. Um, he also sponsored the translation of Sanskrit texts into Persian, and in a very rare move, he also sponsored the translation of Persian text into Sanskrit. Usually Sanskrit to Persian was a one-way highway going out of Sanskrit, um, and the Mughals didn't, didn't challenge that, but, but Zayn did. Um, you know, one thing that is sort of very striking and unique about the Mughal engagement with, with Sanskrit cultural traditions is how broad it was. And it, not just in terms of the number of translations, that's impressive as well, um, but different ways of engaging with Sanskrit, mm -hmm. right? They're translating text. They're sponsoring text written in Sanskrit. Other people notice this and write text in Sanskrit and dedicate them to the Mughals, right, where the Mughals didn't ask for it. They have both Jain and Brahmin Sanskrit intellectuals at their court doing various stuff, right? So there's sort of all these different vectors on which they're working. Um, and that's something that, you know, if it happened earlier, we certainly don't have the evidence to piece it together quite mm. as well. Mm, thank yeah. you. Uh, the other thing that really struck me among the many very interesting and striking things that you said today, I was rather startled by the poem that you cite in which Akbar is put forward as actually an avatar of Vishnu. Yeah. And I 
I'm not a Sanskritist, so I don't know how normal this is, but my understanding of uh, Rajput praise poetry in this period, in the 17th century and in the 18th century, is always of kings uh, telling us that they are very close to Ram or they are very close to Krishna. Sometimes that Ram or Krishna is the ruler of their kingdom and they are ministers mm. in their stead. But I am not used to this characterization of a king as God. I is it normal? Um, I would th it doesn't strike me as abnormal, right? No. I can certainly think of earlier precedents. For example, there's a Sanskrit text from the late 12th century, the Prithviraja Vijaya, that frames Prithviraj Chohan, um, you know, as also an avatar of Vishnu. Um, you know, so it's, it's something that it had been done for at least 400 years by the time we get to the Mughal period. Um, one thing I would say is a bit exceptional in the Mughal context, right, is the Mughals are working with a different idea of God. Right. right. Um, you do not claim that you are God in the Islamic tradition, right? right? That typically doesn't, doesn't end very well. Um, Akbar claimed to be Zile Allah or Zile Allahi, the shadow of God, right? This was a fairly common epithet used by the Mughals and other people. Um, Akbar did at times push the envelope on how far you could go as a Muslim, as Akbar was wont to do, in terms of your closeness to God. Um, the best example of that is Akbar was very fond of the phrase, Allahu Akbar. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And this is a totally unexceptional phrase. You know, if you've ever heard the call to prayer, you've heard Allahu Akbar. It just means God is great. Um, but it can also mean Akbar is God. Okay? <laughs> right? And so there, there came a point, this is written about in some of the Persian histories, when Akbar started using this expression deliberately for its ambiguity. Right? Um, he does receive pushback and actually walks back from that practice a bit. I see. No. Okay. Well, uh, I know that there will be people in the audience who want questions. I wanted to ask her one more question, if I may, which is I'm very intrigued by, you know, the last uh, slide, not the last slide, but almost the last slide where we saw the covers of your two books okay. side by side. And it kind of intrigued me that you would go from the one topic to the other topic. I don't know what your second book is about yet. I'll buy it as soon as it comes out. But in the popular imagination in India, Akbar is very much our hero because he's somebody who is all about syncreticism or at least intellectual curiosity and a magnanimity and an openness in his rule, a tolerance for many different religions. And again, in the popular imagination, Aurangzeb is the polar opposite. So on our side of the border, mm. Akbar is the hero and Aurangzeb is the villain of the popular histories. I'm also well aware that on the other side of the border, it is the reverse which is popularly held to be true, that Aurangzeb is this pious king who is denounced in India for his piety, whereas Akbar was this crazy mm. experimenter who was doing all these loony and heretical things, right? Mm. But for you, as an historian, as an intellectual, do you find a continuity in your engagement with Mughal history through these two figures whom many of us would see as polar opposites? What is linking book one and book two? Mm. In your extraordinarily productive career, I have to say, is remarkable, <laughs> like a book of your. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so okay, there, there's a lot in that question. Um, so uh, from a historian's perspective, Akbar and Aurangzeb are not polar opposites. There, there's quite a bit of continuity there, which is not to say that there were no major differences. Of course, there were. That's something that I talk about in the second book. Um, but Aurangzeb was very concerned with how to be a Mughal king, and one of his primary models on how, of how to do that was was Emperor Akbar. Um, he did not reject his Mughal legacy wholesale or anything like that. Um, let, me, let me say two more things. First, in terms of the image that Akbar is, is this kind of uh, tolerance, you know, pseudo-secular guy, um, one argument that I make in Culture of Encounters is that Akbar was actually not nearly as tolerant as we think he was. Um, for example, you know, he has these Jain Sanskrit knowing, you know, monks at his court, this is all great, everybody's happy, until the question comes up, do the Jains believe in God? Mm. And the Jain monks present a very, I must say, very uh, sort of ingenious and solid case about how they actually do, ha they do believe in a single capital G God. And the reason why they, they do that is because they would be kicked out of the Mughal court otherwise. You could believe in a God that wasn't Khoda, right, that was fine, but you had to believe in a singular God, right, being an atheist or being a polytheist, that was not an option, right? So I mean, Akbar's tolerance, alleged tolerance, had severe limits. 
Um, the second thing that I will say, um, Maybe just sort of generally on the Aurangzeb book. Um, you know, I've heard I've heard a lot from people uh, from India, from Pakistan, from the United States as well about what they think the Aurangzeb book is going to be about, and I fear that all of them are going to be disappointed. Right? Everybody, everybody seems to think that I'm vindicating Aurangzeb or writing some glory story, and that is absolutely not true. I'm actually doing a much more boring project, which is what historians do. We seek to understand historical figures on their own terms. Right? I am not interested in glorifying Aurangzeb, and I am not interested in condemning him. I have no, no, no sort of skin in either in that game. Uh, so to speak. So uh, the, the Aurangzeb book will contain a lot of interesting uh, tidbits, but for those who are sort of looking for my personal opinion on Aurangzeb, or it a hugely is, revisionist history. Right. I mean, Aurangzeb. yeah, I, I, you know, I, I follow my sources. I bring, you know, I mean, objective is a dirty word for historians, right? Nobody is ever full, is never, is ever objective. But I try to honestly make sense of the guy, right? And to explain his actions in historical terms rather than in 21st century communal terms. That's Thank the project. You. Thank you, Audrey. Now, I think there will be several questions. There are two hands, there are three hands that are up quite punctually. Can I ask, okay, whoever's closest to the mic, go ahead. Yeah, you can go second. The mic has already reached somebody Hello. in the middle. Uh, it was a really nice session. It was quite well researched uh, from whatever I heard. So my question is that uh, when you said that the Mughals were sponsoring uh, work, translation works, mm -hmm. is it because they, because they thought of themselves as rulers and wanted to understand the country, or because they mm -hmm. started considering, considering themselves as a part of the country? Hmm. At Wait, point, say, say that one more time. Say so did time. they start, uh, you know, the trans Sanskrit translations because they were rulers and wanted to understand the country they were ruling in, hmm. or they started considering themselves a part of the country, like they now belonged here? In which context do you think? So I guess I suppose I would say that maybe that changed a bit over the course of this hundred-year period that I'm I'm dealing with, right? I mean, you know, the Mughal kings were were born in India, of course, from Akbar on forward. They all spoke Hindi, probably as a mother tongue, at least from Jahangir on forward. Um, Akbar also knew Hindi, you know. I mean, so uh, I mean, this question of were were they Indian? Did they think of themselves as Indian? I mean, I think that as time went on, by the time you get to Shah Jahan, I think yes, absolutely, they did. I think that for the Mughals, that was, it was not an either or choice, right? I mean, for us today, we sort of think, well, if they were a Central Asian dynasty, then they couldn't be Indian, right? I don't think that the Mughals conceptualized that as a sort of one way or, or the other. Um, but maybe one way to look at it is sort of as the Mughals learned more about what was in the Sanskrit works through the translations, as they learned more about this land over which they ruled, and, and as time went on, well, they became more and more Indian, right? Mm. And you have the mic now? Uh, well, as he said, very well researched. Uh, however, how you see the fondness for Sanskrit also developed because uh, Rajputana was in correlation with Mughals. And mm. do you think they were like daughters married from different parts of Rajasthan among Mughal uh, rulers? So to understand Hinduism better, again, Sanskrit was uh, like a good step to step in. Mm -hmm. So. When I started this research, I fully expected to find something like that, some sort of connection with, with the Rajput elites, and I found nothing. Okay, so I, my argument is not that the Mughals were not interested in the Rajput. So my argument is that they pursued that in other ways. Um, you know, even when you look at the Mughal harem and women who say sponsored manuscripts of these Persian translations of Sanskrit texts, um, it was generally not Rajput women who were doing it. It, it, was, it was women from Iran and Central Asia and so on and so forth. So for whatever reason, this appears to have been a bit separate from what the Rajputs were doing. Obviously, Rajput rulers were sponsoring their own Sanskrit works at their courts. Um, you know, I'm not saying that there aren't any connections, but in the story that I have to tell, it, it just does not come up. And what about Deen -e Ilahi, the religion that was formed by Akbar? What mm. uh, you see as his tolerance towards other culture? Yeah. So I think Dini Alahi is the single most overblown thing about Akbar's reign, to be perfectly honest. Um, I don't think it was a religion. I think it was a discipleship program, and it never had more than 12 people involved. Um, the Dini Alahi is where Akbar tried out some of his more kind of extreme ideas. Um, at one point, he tries to rewrite the Shahada, right, the Kalama, the Statement of Islamic Faith, as opposed to Muhammad. Akbar is in there. Um, and that doesn't go over so well. So I mean, the Dini Alahi sort of served as a, as a way to kind of, you know, attack test how far he could push the envelope. Um, but I'm not sure that it was as integral as we think it was. 
Um, so I think there were already some hands up. Wasn't there someone on the side? OK, yes, you, yes. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. Could it be that the uh, poem to Rahim Khane Khanan was addressed to him because of his own knowledge of Sanskrit and Indian tradition, okay. a knowledge which is indicated by his own tomb, uh, which is being renovated, and where they have, for example, discovered uh, swastika decorations on the interior? And okay. could this be an indication of a much wider interest in Sanskrit than just limited to the uh, royal family? That is an excellent question. I really struggle with this in the book, and I don't actually come down very clearly. So on the one hand, um, Abdur Rahim Khane Khanan has this reputation as a sort of great lover of all things Hindu, right? He wrote all these Hindi dohas. There are even Sanskrit works ascribed to him. And yet, he, he sponsored um, a copy of the Mughal Persian Ramayan that I talked about, this translation of the Sanskrit Ramayana. Um, and in that copy, he pens a sort of one-page preface note, and he identifies Rama as the son of Shiva. And it's, I mean, that's a real basic error, right? If you know, like, three sentences about the Ramayana, right, you know that that is not correct. Um, and I mean, scholars have struggled over this for a long time. I, I, I did not discover this. Um, but it's sort of, it's hard to square that, right? I mean, how could he not know something so basic, like who is who Ram is associated with in terms of the Hindu pantheon? Um, and yet all of these, you know, other things are ascribed to him. So to be honest, I don't know. Right, I think that it's quite possible um, that, as you say, knowledge of Sanskrit and you know Sanskrit-based ideas, at least, was more widespread among the Mughal elite than we recognize. Um, if that was so, I think we're going to have a hard time piecing together the evidence for it. But I also think that this sort of Ram is the son of Shiva business, um, uh -huh. this serves as a caution, right? Just because somebody sponsored a manuscript, that doesn't always mean that they read it. It doesn't mean that they even understood the language in which it was written, right? That's something that comes up in how I deal with these Sanskrit poems that the, that the Mughals patronize. So um, Rahim is kind of a tough nut to crack. Okay, do we have till uh, half past? So let's take a few more questions. I see Ken Robin, oh my god, I see so many hands now. So we pass, we'll take maybe three questions from this side and two questions from this side. And Great. you can fight it out between yourselves. Who the two would be. <laughs> Great lecture. Um, two quick questions. Uh, what about the assertion you sometimes see in books saying that, uh, that this was done to make uh, Hindus the people of the book so they didn't have to be oh. exterminated or converted? Yeah. And two, oh. what do you think about the, uh, this is an example for the sub-imperial vernacular illustrated uh, manuscripts of the Ramayana that were made by Bundala Rajput rulers was this a, just an imitation uh, so is you know is it a cultural thing or is there a religious reason for doing making these translations hmm. do you want me to take multiple questions and then answer uh, so should we round up the yeah, yeah 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 listen okay. let me take three let, questions let's and i'll take answer three or four questions from this side the uh, where are all the hands the sea of hands um, could you could you move the mic we'll take a few questions together could you could you move the mic to the back yeah um, in the meantime, could you give the mic to the gentleman who's already standing? Let's take yours. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Uh, hi. So, do you think that there was some Arab influence on Mughals while they were translating Indian texts? Because uh, during the Islamic Golden Age, a lot of Indian literature, specifically scientific literature, mm -hmm. Arabs uh, translated them into Arabic, scientific. Uh, um, number system, for example. So do you think that there was some sort of Arab influence okay. on Mughals? Mm. Okay. Let, let's take another question. Has the mic gone somewhere there? Aren't you passing the mic around? Uh. Uh, hello, ma'am. As was told uh, during the speech, I guess, that many historians who want to study the Mughal era, they usually uh, take up Persian as the main language. So what made you about to decide to take Sanskrit as mm -hmm. uh, the focus okay. uh, language. Oh, do you want to take another question? No, no, no. Let me let me do these. Okay. okay. So I will do I will do this as quickly as possible. So Hindus as people of the book. Hindus have been considered people of the book since the eighth century. So I don't. I think that by the 16th century, 800 years later, I really don't think it was much of an issue. Okay. Um, religion and culture. I'm not sure how to divide those. 
right? I'm not sure how to, how to draw the line. I'm just not sure how to do it today. I'm even more unsure how to do it in the 17th century. For the Arab influence, um, so the Mughals were certainly aware of the, the Abbasid period translation movements of the 8th to the 10th centuries. The way that this came up the most for the Mughals had to do with the Panchatantra, right? The Panchatantra was translated from Sanskrit into Middle Persian in the 6th century, into Arabic in the 8th century, and then back into Persian at several different points thereafter. And when this gets down to Akbar's court, Akbar looks at it, he shows it to some people, and they say, what happened to the Panchatantra, right? This doesn't look anything like the text. Um, and so Akbar actually orders some of the people in his court to go back to the original Sanskrit. It's one of the cases we get where there's sort of this desire to get back to the kind of the Ur text, as it were. What made me decide to study Sanskrit? That's an easy one. I started with it. Um, I started studying Sanskrit as an undergraduate. I did four years of it at the University of Chicago. The decision, my decision to focus on the Mughal Empire came significantly later. Um, I wanted a topic that had a little bit more history to it. I thought, why not pick up Persian? And I found that I hit a gold mine of materials. Uh, actually, this is interesting, Nobin. When did you realize that Mughal Sanskrit was a thing? So, I mean, it's, it started with a suggestion by one of my advisors, um, who is a Sanskritist and doesn't know Persian. And he, you know, he kind of said, you know, I think there might be something there, but I don't know Persian. Go figure it out, right? And I came back six months later with a dissertation proposal, and I said, okay, I'm going to write the history of Islamic interactions with Sanskrit literary culture over a thousand years. Ah. And I started researching it, and I thought, oh my goodness, like, I, you know, I've got enough here for a thousand dissertations. So I had to, to narrow it. Um, but I will never lack for topics going forward <laughs> in my <laughs> academic career, so. <laughs> okay, uh, two more questions we have time for. Can you move the mic to the back, please? Yeah, one gentleman already has it. And if in the meantime you pass, uh, you in the aisle could pass the mic to the next questioner. Yes? Hello, ma'am. When we talk about the foreign policy of Akbar, uh, he stopped thinking about Transoxiana. About, but sorry? Transoxiana? Transoxiana. Mm -hmm. But when we see uh, Shah Jah, Aurangzeb, all they have tried to, you know, capture it. Why we see change in the Mughal dynasty, uh, foreign policy after Akbar? Do you want to? Uh, ne next question. Next question. Uh, uh, yeah. So as a linguist, I wanted to, uh, you know, ask your opinion about what sort of uh, cultural and literary influences precipitated to either side of the spectrum, given the fact that there was a solid interaction between scholars of both these texts mm. while translations were taking place. Um, you know, given the fact that these are two mm. very distinct cultures and they were interacting in the sense that there is going to be a translation which started from uh, interest on the other, the, you know, the higher side of the power. So what sort of cultural implications did it have on the either side of the cultures that were participating in this interaction? Mm. Okay, so, uh, so okay, so in terms of a uh, foreign policy, I, you know, I mean, I, I, I would hesitate to use that word. Um, I mean, I'm not sure how big of a shift there was, right? I mean, the Mughals were generally interested in expansion, exactly where they focused their efforts, so, um, you know, sort of shifted over time. One thing that I do struggle with, I will say, in, in my Aurangzeb book, which, you know, I mean, I'm done writing it, so this is, you know, the struggle is just there, I never really resolve it, is why Aurangzeb was so obsessed with the Deccan, um, especially after he took most of the Deccan and kept going into Tamil Nadu. I'm, I'm not all that clear on exactly what drove that. In terms of the cultural impact on both sides, so uh, one thing I did not talk about here, but I do talk about, uh, particularly in I think the penultimate chapter of Culture of Encounters, is what Sanskrit intellectuals wrote in Sanskrit for Sanskrit communities about their interactions with the Mughals. Um, and this looks very differently for Brahmins and Jains. So Jains write uh, voraciously about what they were doing at the Mughal court. We have thousands of pages of written text by Jains in Sanskrit about what they were doing with the Mughals. And they really used uh, Mughal imperial culture, as some, some Jain groups did, as a sort of model for themselves, right? You start to see, for example, certain Jain monks talking about groups of monks as if they were a Mughal army moving around, sort of things like that. Um, so there's a sort of transference going on of a kind of imperial mold into a religious sphere. 
Brahmins are harder. Brahmins did not write very much about what they were doing at the Mughal court. Um, the best example I can give you of this is that we know from Persian texts that Brahmins collaborated to produce all of these translations, but if we only had the Sanskrit to go on, we would have no idea that they ever took place because Brahmins mm. never wrote about mm. it, not that I have found to date anyways. Um, so it, it's very hard to know as a historian what to do with a textual silence, right? <laughs> Does it indicate anxiety? Maybe, but it could also indicate my anxiety, our anxiety mm. more than theirs. It's hard to know. Thank you very much, Audrey. That's all we have time for, I'm afraid. Uh, I believe she'll be available for a book signing, so if you have any questions that you would like answered, I'm sure you can take them there. But uh, thank you for your remarkable work. Thank you, Kavita. Thank you so much to Audrey Trishki and to Kavita Singh for that fascinating session. Audrey will be signing books um, um, at the back of the, uh, right at the back there in the book signing tent. <laughs>